Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. You know, in some sense, as it's been often pointed out, podcasts aren't that different in spirit from just radio shows, right? We've had shows on the radio for a very long time. But of course, there's also a difference. And a lot of the difference between good old-fashioned radio shows and newfangled podcasts is the device by which you are receiving this podcast. It could be a portable device, right, a phone or a tablet, or it might be your laptop. But this new bit of extra technology lets you do what makes podcasts great, which is you can listen whenever you want, right? It's not like a radio show. You have to wait for that time. You can pause it. You can skip through the parts you find interesting and so forth. It's a tiny change, maybe, but it's an important one that has been made possible by this bit of technology, these devices we carry around with us. And it's just one example about how these devices have really been transforming our lives and arguably even ourselves, who we are. We identify with and use our devices in ways that really hit who we are deep down. And maybe the world's leading expert in this phenomenon is today's guest, Sherry Turkle. Sherry's a professor at MIT who started out studying psychology and has a degree in psychology. That's her PhD. But she became interested early on in the idea of technology and how it affects our psychology. So she got a job at MIT, founding a new way of thinking about the relationship between human psychology and machines and technology, right at the beginning of artificial intelligence and the personal computer revolution and so forth. And even though she was initially quite optimistic about how we can use technology to make the human experience a better one, these days, she finds herself, I think I would accurately say, more often pointing out the worries that we should have. Not that she's anti-technology in any way, but there are ways in which the technology sometimes moves ahead of our ability to understand what is going on. We all know how devices are extremely seductive. We can't put down our phones. The young generation we have right now is growing up in a very different environment than older generations did because of how they relate to technology and to each other. It's something where, in some sense, the art of conversation, of spontaneity, of not knowing exactly what you want to say and therefore spitting something out and maybe it's not exactly right and you have to edit, that's a kind of art form or even just sitting in silence that you don't need to face up to when you have this technological mediation. How does that change who we are, who we want to be, who we present ourselves as to the rest of the world? Sherry has a new book out, which is actually a memoir. It's called The Empathy Diaries. Uh, a memoir is the subtitle. And the idea of writing a memoir is because she does have this interesting intellectual place where she's sitting, and she wanted to try to explain how she got there through her personal story. And uh, The Empathy Diaries is an appropriate title because she wants to emphasize the importance of empathy and personal connection in an age where machines dominate our communication so strongly. I say all this, of course, knowing perfectly well that I am recording this podcast on just such a bit of technology and you are listening to it on just such a bit of technology. So again, not anti-technology here, but this is exactly the kind of situation where we shouldn't let our enthusiasms run away without thinking about it, being cognitive, really trying to understand where we're going rather than just racing willy-nilly from one shiny object to another. That's what this podcast is trying to uh, get us in the mood to do. So let's go. Sherry Turkle, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. My pleasure. So this is an unusual um, interview. I interview plenty of people who have books out, but you have a, a memoir out, which is a little bit of a, a departure. But I think it works well because we can use some of your biography to get into some of the substantive thing that you've done over the years um, in technology and, and communication and so forth. So explain to the audience how you had a career path of becoming a psychologist and a clinical uh, psychiatrist, I guess, and ended up at MIT thinking about technology. Well, um, you sort of had to be there at the time. Uh, <laughs> But really, that's why I wrote the memoir. Uh, the memoir is not a personal um, 
memoir. The memoir is a, a memoir of a very particular kind. It's a, it's a memoir that tries to integrate. It's in the spirit of the question you just asked, because it tries to integrate my personal story and how I ended up doing the work uh, that I do. So it, it answers that very question. I went to MIT because I um, wanted to uh, um, have a place to finish a book I was writing about how intellectual ideas get into the public space um, uh, and sort of hit the street after they've been in the seminar room. Right. So my case study was actually the popularization of French psychoanalysis in the years <laughs> after 1968. Uh, there was this very esoteric guy named Jacques Lacan, hardly anybody read him, very hard to read, very opaque. And then there were these May events, kind of parallel to the French student movement we had here. And all of a sudden, Jacques Lacan was like a movie star. <laughs> Everybody was in psychoanalysis. Everybody was quoting this very, you know, hardly understanding him, I guess. But psychoanalytic ideas were really in the popular culture in a very big way. And I was fascinated by this question of how ideas that are in academia really become part of public discourse, in particular ideas about thinking about the self. Because that really influences therapeutic practice. That's what my thesis was, that's what all my study had been about, was about how really in a culture, you can only help people to get better um, from what's troubling them if you use the ideas that are in the culture. You know, you need to use the ideas uh that are popular in the culture to get through to people and explain their troubles to them in the metaphors that they can understand. Um, so in American society, Freudian ideas, talking to people about their repression or their Oedipus complex or their, you know, uh, their, their childhood, that had been kind of in the public imagination for 30, 40, 50 years. Sure. Um, and not at all in, in France. Those ideas had been shunned. And then all of a sudden in the 60s, they were very much of the popular culture. And I studied that process. And I went to MIT uh, because there was a dean there who thought this work was very, very relevant to thinking about how artificial intelligence mm. and was going to get out and ideas about thinking about the computer we're going to get out into the popular culture. Ideas like, don't interrupt me, I need to clear my buffer. <laughs> Not having enough bandwidth, yes. <laughs> you no, know, I don't want you to reprogram me. You know, um, you know, ideas that represented the mind as a machine. Mm. How were those ideas going to get out? And they felt they sort of needed someone like me someone who was not a computer expert, but a sort of expert on how ideas hit the street, yeah. um, move from the classroom and the laboratory into the culture to think about the new ideas of computers and artificial intelligence. And I was writing up my dissertation as a book and I said, that sounds interesting. And I sort of went to see. <laughs> and I absolutely fell in love with the question. Right. I absolutely fell in love with the question. And, you know, 40 more years later, I'm just as much in love with this question of how, for example, these ideas about the metaverse now are going to change our ideas about thinking about is reality important? Yeah. Or are we okay that we're going to leave reality and go to the metaverse? All of a sudden, you have all these very influential people saying, I want to live in the metaverse. 
let's all make avatars in the metaverse. Let's spend a lot of money in the metaverse. We're going to have commerce and meetings and lovers in the metaverse. Well, what about reality? You know, what about, you know who's going to take care of business? I mean, it, does that mean that we're going to be sold on the idea that not only isn't face-to-face reality important, but reality reality isn't important either you know can we can we not take care of our streets and our homes and our our public parks and our 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 offices and our you know train stations because we're just going to go to the metaverse instead of you know being in the physical right. in physical space well we don't need to go to i mean i i don't i don't want to go on and on but it's the same <laughs> sort of question which is just as, you know, just as compelling now as then. So that's how I made the transition from studying, you know, ideas from Freud and how they changed people's lives to studying ideas from technology and how they change really how we think about living. You know, Um, we did not too... That was the transition. Not too long ago, we had a Lacanian uh, psychoanalyst uh, or psychoanalytical Uh theorist on the Mindscape podcast, Mari Ruti. And I just want to let anyone know who enjoyed that one, that there are some very good Lacan stories in uh, your (laughs) memoir, Sherry. So (laughs) yes, he was a character. (laughs) I went to Paris. I went to Paris and I... Um, I basically said to him, listen, um, I'm writing a book about the impact of your ideas on popular culture, where everybody was making something of this, this man's ideas, different things, <laughs> and usually opposite things. Yeah. And I said, but you've got to, you know, explain to me <laughs> some of your ideas, because I'm really having some trouble here and he uh you know i think he saw me in french there's an expression you know lidio du village i mean sort of like not a village idiot exactly but some sort of naive yeah. you know like and he he who has a reputation for great opacity said yeah i'll explain i'll explain this to you <laughs> and he was actually a very sensitive and very kind uh, teacher to me um, and I try to, in, in this book and in everything I've written about him, try to communicate, uh, you know, how he explained his ideas to me in a way that, you know, I could understand. Uh, and you had the chutzpah yeah. to invite him to give a seminar at MIT, which did not go yes, exactly did. well, as, as, uh, as I, I recall. Did. <laughs> I did. But let's get into this, this mindset because it is a great, you know, sort of right place, right time story where someone yeah. like you at MIT – in the 70s, when it was sort of the, the first heyday of artificial intelligence and people were, yes. uh, like you said, you know, part of that is building artificial intelligence algorithms. But a flip side of that is thinking of human beings as machines, yeah. right? We, we human beings always do that. The latest technology is the metaphor we use to start thinking yeah. about ourselves. So, you know, how did that feel back then in, in, in the 70s? Were you optimistic? Were you like, oh, yeah, human beings are going to be machines? Or were you already a little bit worried that people were taking this too straightforwardly too far? Well, I was, I was very worried. Because my background was to see, um, to me, it was, I called it a move from meaning to mechanism, Mm. from looking, the first first thing that had hit me and the thing that had compelled me to to do this was I was teaching a course uh, that had a a unit uh, on an introduction to Freud. And I was trying to explain what what we call Freudian slips. Mm-hmm. And Freud, in his in his book on slips and his uh, notes on slips, explains Freudian slips. Uh, he calls them parapraxies by by saying by giving an example of a chairman who calls a meeting to order, but instead of calling the meeting to order, he says it's I call the meeting closed. <laughs> in other words, he substitutes <laughs> closed for open right. in the meeting. And um, then he goes into a whole long rigmarole about how he might have done that, why he did that. His wife is sick, so he wants to get home. His, uh, he's ambivalent about what's going to happen in the meeting. I mean, all the meaning reasons that a Freudian would give to unpack that slip. 
And a, a, a hand is raised in the back of the room of a computer scientist who says, I think that you're looking at this in the wrong way in a Webster's Dictionary, closed and open or as far away as C and O, in a Freudian Dictionary, they're opposites, closed and open or as far away as you can get. You have to go into all these meanings and ambivalence and his wife is sick. and <laughs> But in a computational dictionary, closed equals minus open. A symbol has been dropped right. when you make that mistake. There's been a power surge. One bit. One bit. There's been no, it's no problem. I mean, it's like, you know, nothing happened. You had a, a power surge on the line. So there's no, you don't need this whole big production. Just your, there's been a little glitch in the electricity, your brain, your mind, your mind is a series of electrical circuits. I mean, get a, talk about something interesting. I mean, you have a mechanism here that where nothing very interesting has happened. Yeah. And I was so taken aback because I realized that if you do see the mind as a machine, she was absolutely right. This whole infrastructure of meaning depended on a model that she didn't believe in. From her point of view, there was no there was no there there in this story. And I saw that a, a structure in which you looked for meaning was shifting to a structure of mechanism that was going to have all different kinds of assumptions. I guess. And, um, and I tell a story in the Empathy Diaries to illustrate this uh, you know, this is what kept me at MIT. I mean, I was then, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. You know, I was about to leave for some liberal artsy place, you know, but then I was just hooked. And I went to the um, uh, debut of the movie Tron. Oh, yeah. The original with Marvin Minsky, who thought the mind was a meat machine. That's how he said, the mind is a meat machine. He uh, loved Tron because it showed the mind as a meat machine. It showed all the little programs, you know, interacting in the, in the mind as little, you know, anthropomorphic programs. He loved that. And then he said, you know, and, and children will go see movies like this and they'll never see movies like Bambi. <laughs> and, I, and I and I and I bit, I bit. Mm. You know, he had me. I, yeah. I shouldn't have risen to the bait, but I did. I said, "Why not Bambi?" I, every kid sees Bambi, and he says, "Because in Bambi, the children get attached to their mothers, and the mother dies, and in the world we're going towards, the robots will be immortal, will be taken care of not by the mothers but by the immortal robots." There'll be no death. Will be uploaded onto the computer. Mm -hmm. In other words, he gives me this whole AI version right. of how we're on the way to this radical self improvement in AI. And I realized, whoa, you know, this just isn't a a theory. This is a whole way of of a philosophy of being in the world. And I think that that really is what we're struggling with now, even as we talk about the metaverse. Uh, it, you know, it, it's not, it, or, or talk about robot caretakers for our children or robot psychotherapists, which is being pushed so much, or robot companions or robots who will love us or, you know, all of the, all of the things that are so current now in our discourse. Um, is how much do we care about our bodies, about having human companions, about the specificity of being human? All of these were questions that were posed for the first time when I first got to MIT. Now we're living them out in real right. technology that is being proposed to us, but they were proposed in theory when I first got there. I'm I'm interested in that story about the bit flipping uh, in the in the Freudian slip context because I, I can kind of see both sides here. I mean, uh, at a 
deep intellectual level, I'm sympathetic to the idea that the mind is a machine, that, you know, ultimately yes. there's neurons and they're obeying laws of physics, etc. But of course, it's a kind of machine that is so enormously more complicated than what we build on our right. computers right now, that to think of a human being making that wrong word choice as just a bit flip is probably hopelessly naive, I would think. Well, also where, where we, I think I do believe along with the uh, with the tradition and represented by, you know, phenomenologists and Merleau-Ponty and in the computer world by Hubert Dreyfus, by Antonio Damasio, that we're a particular kind of machine that's attached to our bodies right. and very specific bodies and bodies that have a life cycle and bodies that feel pain and bodies that know they're going to die and bodies that were born and bodies that grew up being attached to parents on whom they were dependent. And, you know, that, that I think that those experience, those embodied experiences and those experiences of dependency and attachment really create a specificity of the human that even if you have a neuronal accident and you drop a bit because you know, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. And you say <laughs> open when it's, you mean closed because yeah. let's say you, you have a, <laughs> a bit drop. You know, still when you do that, it triggers associations from all of those other systems and with all of those other consequences. Um, so I think that we are more complex and I always like to quote, you know, it's, some, it's so funny that when you write several books, there's people sometimes say, well, do you repeat yourself? And I say, I intentionally repeat a couple of times. I've intentionally repeated a story because I loved it so much. And I, I wanted to give the author credit. I don't repeat stories of mine, but I mm. repeat other people's work. And Peter Kramer wrote a book, Listening to Prozac, quite a few years ago. But he tells a story at the beginning of Listening to Prozac. I mean, it was a very big book when he wrote it. I mean, he, so he you know, got a lot of credit for how brilliantly it was written. But I, but I give him extra, extra credit because he began it with the following story that I think sums up the human condition and the question you've just asked me so perfectly. And the story is this that he was a psychiatrist working at Brown University in the counseling department. And a student comes in, he says he's depressed, and Prozac was just coming out, and Kramer gives, you know, gives the student Prozac for the depression. Three weeks later, the student comes in, and the student says, I'm not sleeping. Mm -hmm. And Kramer, the last notes he has on his, in his student chart, for the chart, says that he gave Prozac, and he knows that Prozac sometimes leads to sleep disorders. He says, not to worry, I'll give you something for the sleeping. This often happens when people take Prozac. And the student says to him, no, I didn't take the Prozac. I'm not sleeping because I feel guilty towards you about not having followed your advice. Right. And Kramer says that in the in less than a heartbeat, in less than a second, I mean, it didn't take a second. He went from seeing that student as a bundle of synapses that he was going to treat with Prozac and, and, and serotonin at the synapse yeah. to seeing that student as in an edible context and he and the transference and and what had happened in the transference to him and what about his relationship with his father and as part of a family system and how was he going to deal with his family system and his, and his whole relationship to this completely divorced from this whole thing about <laughs> the mind is a machine right. and what the Prozac could do with the synapse, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and I, and he said, that is what is extraordinary about the human condition, that we relate, we can relate to each other and at the same time, machine to machine, Prozac giver to Prozac receiver, 
and as edible transference yeah. figure to sun. And the, the way he describes that flip, and then, of course, he had to flip back because then he's the question is, well, what can Prozac, you know, he still maybe wants to try yeah. Prozac, you know. <laughs> but, but that it's that way, it's that way that we all live that really is the human condition, that we are both and that one doesn't exclude the other. And it's time that we stop behaving as though, well, we'll just go into the metaverse so we don't need to be in our bodies anymore. You know, you know. I mean, we have to start, stop behaving as though we're on the red, as though we're behaving like we all saw the matrix and we have to choose between the red pill and the blue pill. We, we have to, we, actually, our situation is that we don't get to do one pill or the other pill. We live in the fully hybrid world. Our minds now are in a fully hybridized situation. So we're talking now on, I mean, I'm, you know, you see where I'm going, so I'll stop my lecture. But, but, we, <laughs> but, but the human condition is that we are both. You know, I wish I had known that story because when I wrote my book, The Big Picture, I talked a lot about how you can describe the same situation using different vocabularies that are uh, very different in content, yes. but are both right as long as they're compatible with yes. each other. This is a great example well, of, of exactly same, that. It's the same thing, except yeah. what I think that happens to clinicians, what happens to people, you know, what happens to, and this gets back to your first question about being a clinician, is that if you're a clinician, you operate... You, you have to operate on both levels because we do have drugs. Mm -hmm. We do have medications that can, we're not to use the medications would be mal would be wrong to say, no, I'm just talking to, I'm just talking to everybody, you know, Freudian mind, the Freudian mind, that would be wrong because these medications do calm people down mm -hmm. to the point where they're more accessible for conversation. So, you know, certainly someone like Kramer is not a completely anti-medication person. But the point then is to have a conversation with, with the more complex person who did have a relationship with his father. And so when some fancy psychiatrist said, do this, he said, the hell with that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do anything that an older man tells me to do. Uh, no. But then later he came back realizing he was... <laughs> you know, there was something maybe to learn here. Since well, now he was depressed and angry at Peter Kramer and angry at his father and still depressed. And maybe there was something to get out of this experience. And speaking of conversations, I, this, this provides a wonderful segue because um, – it is a different world that we're in now than we were in the 70s in terms of how this technological revolution is going to affect us. And I think that the idea of people carrying around small mobile devices that are conduit to interacting with the whole world was probably not nearly as appreciated in the 70s as it is uh, manifest to us right now. So you, you've done a lot of work and thought a lot about how – having these devices changes how we behave, but also who we are. In fact, you already mentioned the fact, as Antonio Damasio was another former podcast yeah. guest, and he and others have really emphasized the existence of the body as an important part of who we are. And now, in some sense, these little phones and iPads and laptops that we carry around are becoming extensions of our body and changing who we are. Yes. I mean, I, I actually, in the Empathy Diaries, I talk about the uh, the change in my work because in the beginning that my first book when I got to MIT and I saw this new world of devices and 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 AI and thinking of the mind as a machine and the way people I called my first book the second self because I saw the way people were projecting themselves onto the computer I called it an evocative object I because it was sort of on the border between mind and not mind I thought it was a a place where people were exploring this, their sense of self and their question of um, free will. And I, I even said what sex was to the Victorians, the question <laughs> of free will is to our generation, that the that programming brings up that question of free will. That I mean, I, I, I wasn't positive. I was talking about all of these very, you know, these, these, these big questions that AI raised. But it was a, it was a book of discovery and exploration. Then, when the mobile phone 
And I wrote another book that was very positive, which is a book called Life on the Screen, where I talk about people going into muds and things like the metaverse and playing Sims and Second Life. And, you know, again, exploring through avatars, gender and their personality and taking on different roles and doing role playing. And I saw the dangers, but I also talked about them as identity workshops and placed, you know, how Mm -hmm. uh, cyberspace was a place to play with identity. Again, I talked about the problems. I talked about addiction. I talked about, I mean, I talked about a lot of things, but my attitude was these are places of psychological possibility. Let's study them. I'm basically an empiricist. I'm not a moral philosopher. But when I saw that people were walking around with, <laughs> with the world of computation to enter, you know, <laughs> you know, just <laughs> like that. Sherry is holding up her phone uh, to I'm her. <laughs> holding up my phone. I'm, 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 I'm applying it directly yeah. to my head. <laughs> I, my attitude shifted because my model of how people had been using the phone as an identity device involved sitting on your couch with your friends and your family and your baby and your lover, your mother, your brother, <laughs> you're in your, in your, your, and then walking away going to your office, sitting at your computer and have, doing some identity exploration yeah. and then getting up from your chair and walking back to your living room and being with your family again. In other words, it was a, it was a going to the place of therapy or experimentation or, or you, know, you know, being in a parallel universe and then coming back to the real. Right. And what the phone did is it broke that barrier. So the people were cycling through. People were cycling. I called it cycling through that when in the in the original model, people kind of cycled through the real and this metaverse. And then the cycling through became the rapid cycling became so rapid that the boundaries broke down. Yeah. And people were going back and forth and back and forth and back. I mean, the, the people said I, I, I re- that, the, that the world really that they were accessing from their phone was more real than their real life, was often more compelling than their real life. And what distresses me now is that people are saying, well, let me just not say people, like Mark Zuckerberg or anybody who's pushing the metaverse, which is increasingly like a lot of companies because they're going to make a lot of money on it. They're saying that's right. We are going to make the metaverse more compelling than the real. You're going to want to work in the metaverse. You're going to want to play in the metaverse. You're going to want to. And I, I saw a New Yorker cartoon that was. I, I, I was trying to explain it to some friends, and I, I think I'm going to make it like my holiday card. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was. It was like a cartoon about. Things that we're going to have a hard time explaining to the next generation, you know, like things that will be difficult for my grandchildren to like understand how it used to be, where a grandmother is with her grandchild and the grandmother is, has Oculus glasses on. And she's saying to the grandchild, okay, now when we're together now in the metaverse, do you see me with these goggles or do you just see me or... Do you see me without the goggles? And the little grandchild says to the grandmother, oh, no, Grandma, I see you as a unicorn because that's the avatar I've made for you. <laughs> so the grandmother says, you mean you don't see me, your grandma, when I visit you? And the grandchild says, no, no, I, it's just your, your, your unicorn. <laughs> and the grandmother says, so what's the point? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you need me? <laughs> Why are we doing so? If, if you don't see me, what's well, what's the point of this visit? <laughs> mm, deep question there. So, and I mean, now we're pushing that the you know the the, the it was it was so touching to me because because you know I like it so much that I can see you. I mean, your listeners don't know, but I can actually see you. It helps it the mean, conversation. It means, it means everything to me that I can see you. Yeah. I mean, uh, if you were just there as a little avatar, a little unicorn, I mean, what's the 
how's that going to help me? I mean, I see you, I see your books, I see your guy who has posters. I mean, it, I don't know. It's just nice. <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, uh, yeah, the metaverse, <laughs> I, I wasn't planning to go there, but it's a, it is a compelling thing. Um, I, I mean, let's, let's, let, let me pretend to push back because I think I get yeah, your push back. Yeah. I think I get your point, but, um, in the metaverse, you know, we call it the metaverse, I guess, because Facebook decided that's what they wanted yeah, to I mean, be. Whatever. It's virtual I mean, reality. It, it is, yeah, yeah, you know, virtual reality. I, I had a little house in Second Life. I've given talks in Second Life, et cetera. Yeah. You know, they're not very advanced technologically. Um, but, you know, you can look however you want. You can live however you want. Uh, you can travel by teleporting or flying. I see the attraction there. Um, how how should we think about using that in the original optimistic sense of identity workshops? Well, I mean, I've if you, studied you, that. Yeah, I mean, I've studied that for years and years. And, yeah. I'm, and I'm completely, um, I mean, I was a great fan of that because it has very powerful, very positive things to it. You, you get to play with identity. You get to play. People can play with gender. Mm -hmm. people, young people can be old. You get to play with what it's like to be an old person if you're young and how you're treated. If you're a woman, you get to see the kind of authority you have as a man. If, you, if you're short, you get to be tall. I mean, I remember being, I mean, I'm five I say I'm 5'4", but I'm lying. I'm really 5'3 and a half. And I get to see what it would be like to be 5'8", 5'9", yeah. even. It's a different experience. I mean, you, ju you know, you just, it is a very powerful thing to, to play with elements of identity and to present yourself in different ways. And, and, I, hundred, and, and these are very, that, that whole notion of, um, I talk in my, in my work on this about Eric Erickson's idea of the moratorium. About how um, about how he wrote about how in adolescence traditionally people were allowed a kind of time out mm. to try different things to experiment with different things and there's no moratorium in American society now I mean you're you know I mean my God you know I mean now on Facebook I mean you're, you're from 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 eight you're 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 tracked you have a you have a trail of but but it's not even that you're tracked there's no there's no sort of time out, you know, there's no idea of, there's no notion of adolescence as a time of no consequence. There's no Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer time. There's no life on the Mississippi. There's no sense of 13 year olds or 13 year olds, but that's because 13 year olds didn't used to carry guns and, you know, shoot people. I mean, there, you know, there was a sense of childhood, boys will be boys, you know, there, but when people, you know, when the when the level of, uh, well, you know what I mean, when the level of violence and aggression reaches a certain point, you know, swiping some, uh, you're not, you know, it, it, it becomes too much. In, in any case, that that's out of, American life doesn't have that anymore. But it was nice to have those, it, that sense of adolescence at the time when people tried on identities. Like, for example... You know, people tried on. I'm going to. I'm going to try on Catholicism. There used to be a lot of, in my circle. You know, people would try out being Catholic or try out being uh, Muslim or try, uh, people are not tr trying out so much religion because it goes with such a heavy. Now it goes with such a heavy overlay of um, of other meanings. Um, so that's what it's good for. It's good for all of this trying out. Now. Um, when the metaverse becomes, or when augmented reality or virtual reality really becomes the place where we live, where consequential decisions are made, where it's where we have our relationships, where it's where we go to work, where it's where we, you know, where, where we sculpt a primary sense of identity, where I wake up, I put on my glasses or my contacts or my goggles, and, you know, that really becomes me. Um our, our ways of having conversations uh, are going to change. Our ways of being spontaneous are going to change. Our ways of experiencing our physicality, our, our, our commitment to um, the environment, our commitment to the city, our commitment to what our streets look like are going to change, our commitment to what our offices look like. Um, 
if 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 you if you anticipate that that four days a week people are going to be working virtually or even three, uh, you're more likely to say, well, on the two days or they come to work, well, it doesn't matter so much. They're in a beautiful office or you know or what yeah. their office is like yeah. or. No, I mean, I, mean, I think we, this is really we reveal so much to each other when we're with each other face to face. There's something very interesting here, and just just in many ways, but with the question of identity in particular as just one example, yeah. I think you you've brought up sort of two flip sides. One is that in virtual spaces, we can try on different identities, right? On the internet, no one knows you're a dog. You know, you can yeah. you could you can play act. But at the same time, in our, if you want to call it the real world, our tangible physical uh, reality, it's had the opposite effect. You can't reinvent yourself as easily because you have this record out there on yes. Twitter or Facebook or whatever. And I remember there was a poignant moment in, in one of your books where you mentioned students in college, you know, wistfully saying, I guess it used to be possible to go to college yes. and be a different person, but you can't now because everyone can look you up on Facebook and they know who you are. <laughs> yes. Yes. And the idea that virtual reality becomes a place for experimentation because you can somehow try to erase an avatar. Uh, and what about when you can't erase an avatar anymore? I mean, what, what, what makes us think that, you know, I think that virtual reality is as, 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 as the, as, as the metaverse becomes more corporate, this whole notion of, you know, it's playfulness is going to go away too, because you're going to be mm. dealing with real money and selling real things. And you're going to need to ha have a real reputation. It's not just going to be, Oh, that was my avatar because I wanted to work out something. <laughs> so, I mean, I, you know, I think that a lot of the things that I saw are so positive about, you know, uh, this identity space are going to f fade, fall off. As it becomes more like it was, as it becomes our real life. Yeah. So but basically, I'm actually very concerned about the kinds of relationships and attachments and empathy hmm. that people that, that you that you get avatar to avatar. Um, you know, um, because I think that what defines us as human ultimately, you know, this is playtime. It's great to have all these technologies and to play with them and to see their affordances and to see what they're good for and to, you know, I'm, I'm not a Luddite. I think we should all try everything. And I don't believe in closing down work on anything mm -hmm. and you know, nothing like that. But I think we've had a little experience now. And um, I don't think that, um, I think we've learned that too much time online, too much time on screens. We don't form the same sorts of attachments. We don't form the same sorts of sense of, you know, responsibility and connection. It's just easy to ghost somebody. Mm. You know, the amount of people who end relationships, both, both romantic, but also work relationships, of all sorts, relationships of all sorts. You know, not just, oh, my... You know, my boyfriend ghosted me, but my colleague ghosted me, my friend ghosted me, my, by just the sort of vague, talk to you soon, chow chow, you know, and then somehow they're, you know, they're, they're gone, you know, they're, you know, colleagues and, you know, kind of because they can just, not because they, they're being mean or uh, even feel they're being unprofessional, but because they can. Really, yeah. You know, no. I, I had a I had a very significant relationship with an with an edit with an with an editorial colleague, and uh, uh, who I meant very well, and he meant me very well. And then I think if it had if if all of our meetings had been, had, if if our relationships had not been so internet mediated, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It, things would have ended differently because this way it was just like, oh, you know, ciao, ciao, see you online. And then uh, emails don't get answered and it just is very vague or they get answered with a very cursorily. And just because you can, not because people are trying to be, people can end things and defer things and not get back to you and, in business practice, 
just because they can. And people don't want to be vulnerable. People don't like, for example, firing people or mm. rejecting people. Professionally, I'm not just talking about in personal sure. life or love. But nobody wants to send a rejection letter. Much easier to just not answer. Mm. And so not answering <laughs> becomes like a, a thing because you can. And it's, ghosting isn't just for lovers. Ghosting is for every level of professional life. You know, <laughs> I should write a book called "Ghosting is Not Just for Lovers." There I you go. That. No, I like that. All right. I, think I love that. Ghosting is not. It's a great ghosting title. Ghosting is for every level of professional uh, life. Well, you it, just is, don't it, it speaks it to something away. you know tangible about this difference because <laughs> on the one hand, it's easy to say that higher levels of connectivity help us meet and interact with a wider variety of people, and that's good. But what you're pointing out is that those connections that we make seem to us much more disposable and temporary and ephemeral than the ones we make in If we want them to space. be. Yeah. If we want them to be. I mean, I had a wonderful, you know, when Stephen Colbert had his, um, you know, his original show I was on, it was called The, the Colbert yeah. Reporter one. I was on that program. And he's such a brilliant man, and he... He asked, and, and uh, I guess Alone Together had just come out, and he interviewed me for that book. And it was such a privilege because he's so brilliant. And he asked me the following question. He said, in character, as, you know, yeah. the, the, whoever he was, the, the character he was playing, the Stephen Colbert character. And the question was, don't all those little sips of connection add up to one big gulp of conversation? <laughs> yeah. And I said, no, no, they don't. But it was it was the greatest question. It was exactly the question because a thousand sips of connection during the day are not the same as sitting down with somebody and saying, look, I've sent you I've sent you a P I've sent you my artwork for critique. I want to know if your gallery is interested in me. You've had it for a year. I've, <laughs> I've got nothing. Could, could you know, I, uh, I'd like, you've had my slides. Could we have a five minute conversation that about, about them and whether you, I should be considering you as a gallery for my future, if I should move on. And, and, and that conversation, you know, doesn't happen. Right. <laughs> you, know, you get, I mean, I'm not an artist, but I've interviewed enough artists yeah. to know that that conversation <laughs> doesn't happen. Well, and what I what I like about the the analysis you give of this is that you make the point that a lot of things we would think of as um, bugs or uh, disadvantages of person to person conversation are actually features, right? Are actually yes. things that are really <laughs> necessary. The awkwardness, the silence, the getting it not quite right the first time you say it, right? I mean, you, you, you try to make the point that these are actually useful and helpful parts of the process, not things we should polish away. Yes. One of my favorite interviews um, uh, on this point was um, a, a young woman who I was interviewing about conversation. And she says, you know, there's a there's an eight minute rule that you have to really listen to somebody for eight minutes <laughs> in order to understand what they're saying. That's a long time. They stop, they start. I mean, if you really want to understand, like, if even if you like somebody, you know, or really like, you know, not even romantically, but she was talking like, just like, who is this person? Mm. In her experience, it takes eight minutes. You know, okay. it says... People say it takes less than a nanosecond for, for people to know if they want to be intimate with each other, but it takes eight minutes. And I'm, I'm willing to believe that, but it takes eight minutes to like figure out who is this? I mean, who is this? What, what is their experience? Where, I mean, are they like ch a child of a Holocaust survivor? Have they been abused? Have they, who am I talking to? Mm. Who am I talking to? Is this somebody who's been abandoned? Is this somebody who's, you know, spent their life uh, trying to carve out an individual identity? I mean, who am I talking to? And um, after saying that, I'm thinking, I found my goddess. I mean, this is my, <laughs> my <laughs> this is my woman. And then she says, but I don't have the patience to do that. <laughs> I just, I, I, I can't stay away from my phone that long. I've lost my ability. I've lost my ability 
Wow. To hang in there. Wow. And and uh, and I feel that there's a kind of vicious circle of our incapacity for solitude, our incapacity for boredom, our incapacity to stay with people for eight minutes. You know, our incapa- our, our 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 incapacity to just be with you know to just be with with people and just kind of take them in to give them that kind of patience because in 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 the metaverse something's always happening you, yeah. you're making the avatars just don't sit around uh kind of in a, like a lump you know it's like a it's an active environment and we get used to uh, constant activity and you know boredom is your imagination calling to you <laughs> and uh so in 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 the empathy diaries what i try to do is i try to link you know my personal story and growing up uh in a particular kind of household with with empathy denied me to my interest in how important empathy is and how mm. You know, when you create a technological environment in which empathy is going to be denied to a lot of people, um, you know, you and you're going to have robots and chatbots, not, you know, who can't show empathy at all, um, how you're playing with fire. And that's really more the, uh, you know, that's more the messaging, I think, that I, that, that my work now has, is that we're at a point where we, given who we are psychologically, we're playing with fire hmm. with who we are psychologically as humans. How and well playing, How well do we understand, psychologically speaking, why the devices have this pull on us? Why it is so hard, even though, you know, we... designed to, because we know a lot about human psychology. Mm-hmm. We know, for example, what makes us compelled to stay at something. You know, we're compelled by devices that engage us with rage, for example. Mm. We know that we're engaged by being angry. We know that we're engaged by anxiety. We know that we're engaged by uh, not having stable feedback, but by having intermittent positive feedback or, you know, so all of the, so Facebook's algorithms engage us by keeping us angry, by keeping us on the edge of our seat, by giving us intermittent feedback, and by keeping us in a silo with other people who agree with us and who are make, going to make us angrier and angrier. And, you know, so the more we, so we're, it's like we're a slot machine that's been designed specifically for us. When we sit down to play a video game or when we sit down to do a little Facebook we think we're just doing a little talking to our friends, but everything yep. is designed to keep us in a, to get mad, to stay with people who are going to keep us mad. That's a, that's a way, and to be shown ads for things that we really are pre-tested to know that we want. So we're, we're sort of like a trembling string of purchase purchase, being made angry, being shown more pictures of things that are going to make me angry. I mean, you know, it's not just people who are being made angry by being told that there's, you know, you know, it's not just people on the right who are being made angry. Oh yeah. I'm on the I'm on the left and I'm being I'm being constantly revved up by being shown things that are going to make me angry and angrier on the left. In other words, sometimes people get this wrong impression that, oh, it's only people on the right who are being showed Pizzagate and, you know, thing crazy things, crazy, you know, um, you know, uh, stories of things that couldn't possibly be true about vaccines or stuff. Right. No, it's everybody I'm being shown <laughs> things that are going to make me crazy about Canadian truckers and, you yeah, know, and yeah. Nazi flags being you know, desecrating things that I think are important. So, I mean, I'm, I'm being whipped up into a, into a, into a, into a crazed state. And then I'm being thrown in with people who are going to, who are also furious and make me feel as though I'm in a community of other angry, 
crazed people. And so it's siloing us into more and more tribal. Well, this isn't good. I mean, obviously <laughs> this is. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so your, if your question was, um, well, how does, how, how does it keep, you know, why are we being so compelled is that we know so much about human psychology and this, all this, all this smart knowledge is being turned towards making our devices compelling to us. Is it a good analogy to think of it like almost as empty calories? You know, uh, we seek out sugary, sweet things because 10,000 years ago it was hard to get calories and, you know, we were, we were trained to look for those. And now that's not really the best thing we can, we can have for our health. And likewise, you know, the, these psychological techniques that our devices or our social media use to hook us – are you know are are giving us something we do want, but it's sacrificing something harder and and more important. Is that a good way of thinking of it? Well, you know, it, it, that's a, such a good question. I'm not sure that we would be so um, tempted if our society wasn't in a period of such social fragmentation. Okay. In other words, you know, everything is working in in sort of very a very vicious circle of unhappy lockstep to get us to a point where sitting alone in our room, uh, getting angry, buying stuff and hanging out with other angry people seems like a good idea. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are these wonderful studies about the precipitate, and this is even before COVID, but the precipitous decline in civic organizations. I mean, America, for all of its, um, you know, terrible problems, its systemic racism, its, you know, all the things that, you know, have, have gotten us into so much trouble, uh, inequality and so forth. Um, it, it, one of the miracles of the country, no, you know, de Tocqueville noticed it in 1830, was our... Our amazing, um, the amazing organization of our uh, civic organizations, our flor floral, you know, fl garden clubs, the mm. women's clubs, you know, the church organizations, the the choral societies that every group, every county had, the bands that every city had, the the high school marching bands, the organization, the parents, teachers associations. The, I mean, that if you moved into a community and you wanted to make friends, there were, there were 15 things in your community that were waiting for you. Yeah. And that those have just been closing at a clip and that there seems to be very little pushback uh, as those close, people are just not feeling that connection to their communities anymore as these close. So, you know, yes, you still have religious organizations. You still, you know, you know, the fact that the Catholic church has had such a terrible, um, you know, crisis and such a terrible encounter with its, you know, historical, uh, uh, its historical uh, tragedies, uh, you know, was certainly something that, you know, had to happen, but, you know, there go all of those, um, organizations in the, in, in the, in, in the, in the parish that kept people at making lunches for each other and yeah. elderly people and kids. And, you know, I mean, so there's some, you know, there's a, there's a lot, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, that's a big loss to a community. Um, and that's true of, of religious organizations across the board uh, and other kinds of civic organizations as well. Um, similarly, when I was a kid growing up, I lived on a block where we had a democratic club. And uh, I mean, God knows what kind of graft and corruption was going on. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even know. You know yeah. I have no comment. I haven't studied it. But 
you know, this was just happened to be a block in Brooklyn where I'm sure there was not a Republican. You know, I mean, this Democratic club didn't have to do a lot of politicking to get votes. <laughs> so and they, they had like, um, you know, they had uh, speeches and they had, you know, children's fairs and they had civics lessons and they had, I mean, it, you know, they had, it was a community and they had potluck dinners and they had an elderly program and they had, um, that's not happening anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so that's not what the local democratic club is doing. It, you know, it's professional organizers coming in and I mean, it's, it's, I think potluck dinners and giving <laughs> seniors meals and door to door and giving out food is gone. I'm, I guess I'm saying that, that we are, this, the, the, the society is quite atomized and the, the, the idea of digital friends, for example, mm -hmm. is such a crazy idea because there's no friend there. There's no person there to be a friend. And yet I've, I've interviewed so many people who say that seems like such a good idea to have a digital friend, a friend <laughs> who can never disappoint you. Well, I, I do think that, um, again, the flip side of this would be that there are people who don't fit in to their local communities and can find like-minded individuals uh, much more easily over the internet than they can in, in yes. physical space. Yes, and I'm a hundred right. I'm for it. I'm for. I mean, but there are two different things. There's using the internet to find other people, and there's using a program to be a friend. Good. Yeah. And I think it's very important to make this distinction. I love using the internet to find other people. And then potentially you convert that relate, you know, at a certain point you say, Hey, right. let's, let's have a coffee, you know, or, uh, you know, next time you're, you know, you're in, you know, you're in, if you're far away, you know, you meet halfway or you try to find a person who is not necessarily 3000 miles away, but you try to find a, you know, people join chess clubs or playing word games or whatever, and they, you know, they meet or they get on Zoom or they, you know, they, they become closer and closer to the reality of another person. There, I'm really, you know, I using the internet to, to, to join with other humans and to ultimately get to a meetup with humans where you can build on that. I could not be more pro. Right. <laughs> but I actually see more and more people wanting to make friends with chatbots as an alternative mm. to the vulnerability of dealing with another person. Well, this is so another... I, guess I wasn't making myself clear is that I actually see a, a slippage right past using the internet to talk with other people where you're less vulnerable because you can ghost them or, you know, kind of just keep the conversation simple, moving right past that to, you know, uh, to having psychotherapy with a chat bot and then having a best friend chat bot, a companion chat bot. And you already did mention the idea that we're building, you know, robot therapists or companions yes. for elderly or kids or, or yes. whatever. And so are you, I mean, what, what is your take on that? Is it, uh, a good stopgap. All bad. All okay. Bad. All, bad. All bad. No, because it gives. I have nothing. I really have nothing good to say. Mm -hmm. Because even if the whole point is that the people who are for it say the people you can't tell you're talking to a. If you can't tell you're not talking to a person, what's the harm? <laughs> and to me, that's the profoundly. Yeah. dangerous, a profoundly dangerous position. I mean, that's a, um, uh, that gives up on the essential of the human uh, endeavor. It's the, it's the Turing position. You know, if you're talking to a machine and you can't tell it's a machine, the machine is intelligent. Well, no, not necessarily. It just means the machine has fooled you into thinking, you, you're not being able to tell. It doesn't mean that it's intelligent at all. So would you want it to make a decision about war and peace? Would you want it to make mm. a decision about your child? Would you want it to make a decision about, <clears throat> would you want to discuss a relationship with it? Would you want to discuss questions of equity or social justice with it? It has no skin in the game. 
It doesn't care. It doesn't care about the future of the planet. It doesn't care about my baby. It doesn't care about my life. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't love me. It has no, I mean, I really mean skin in the game was not, I mean, that's, that's what came to mind. That's yeah. what I said. But literally, it has no literal humanity. skin. <laughs> it has no stake. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's the people who have the stake. It's the people who can form attachments. The machine can form an, an attachment that matters with you. So like during COVID, I, uh, a New York Times reporter called me and he said that he, um, millions of people were signing up or hundreds of thousands to this new, wonderful chatbot. And uh, did I want to comment? And I said, well, sure, I'll, I'll sign up and I'll try it out. And, um, and I would, and I said, but you're looking for me not to like it, right? Because you know that I'm, <laughs> he said, well, yeah, because everybody likes it and you're Pretty uh-huh. sure not to like it. So I said, look, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to just say it's bad. I'm going to try it out. So I tried it out and I made an avatar. I made an avatar of a female therapist. And I just sat down and I said, well, you know, it's, it's the pandemic. Are you, you know, can we have a conversation in which you're my, we have a conversation about things that are troubling me during the pandemic, during quarantine. And the chatbot said, yes. And uh, I can, I said, well, our, can we discuss loneliness? Because that's my biggest problem. Mm-hmm. I can't see my daughter and I, I'm living here alone and I want to discuss loneliness. And uh, she said, yes. I mean, it said yes. And I said, well, you know, what do you think? You know, what are your first thoughts? Because really being loneliness is my, is really my greatest issue and how to handle loneliness. And she says, well, you know, loneliness is warm and fuzzy. <laughs> so I took a screenshot. Uh, it was a bug. By the next day, I'm sure it was fixed because it was so bad. I took a screenshot. I'm sure by the next day, it says something really like from Heidegger or something very from, mm. you know, very, very <laughs> you know, from Mary Oliver or something very, you know, very appropriate. I sent it back to the New York Times reporter and I said, look, this is why I don't hold it against the program it's called Replica. I don't hold it against the program that it doesn't know. But this is why people need to talk to people now. You know, I, I, I need to talk to somebody who is afraid of getting sick. This is before the vaccine, you know, who's afraid of getting yep. sick, who's afraid of being intubated who's afraid of saying goodbye to their child on a, on a iPad. <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? I need to talk to a person who has a body who's over 60, who's, <laughs> you know, I, I, and who's lonely. This yep. is the fact that it could pretend to be lonely and that tomorrow it will succeed in pretending to be lonely is of no use to me. And this is why, uh, it's 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 inhuman to have people talking to this, and you know everybody else liked it, so I was a dissenting uh, you were, voice. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were. a dissenting voice. You played but your it's, role. It, it, it's we deserve we deserve each other. It's an area in which I don't think that there's so much good that artificial intelligence can do to to pretend to be human in an area that is so uniquely human. Empathy, body sense, life cycle, children, it's just overreach. Yeah. You know, it's just profound overreach. Well, maybe my- as a, a set of closing thoughts, um, look, look, we all have these devices. We all use the Internet. It's, it, that's not going yeah. away. Are there, from your research, from your thinking about these things, are there strategies or techniques you've come up with for dealing with them in healthy ways? Do you think that, that people on the street are sort of making some common mistakes that we can fix? Or it, it, should we leave it to the companies that are building these devices no, no. to try to <laughs> – I didn't think so. No. I just, just wanted to check. No, I, th- I think there's some very common – well, the, the common things for dealing with your daily use should be, you know, no phones in the car. Mm. You should say to your children, the car, you make sacred spaces in your life where the devices don't go. So you leave room for conversation, you know, not the car, not the, not anything having to do with food preparation, mm. 
or food eating. So not the not the kitchen, not the table, and not the car. You just say the car is you're a captive audience, and this is where we talk. Right. And your children say no. This is where I do my social media. And when they're young enough, you say no. I I'm driving, so I'm not doing my social media. And this is it's important that our family talk. So the most important thing is to establish that it's important that human beings talk to each other. And mm. that's the first thing that, that I think that it, sort of getting back the importance of conversation um, goes a long way in a family towards uh, putting phones away when they should be. And phones shouldn't be in classrooms and they shouldn't be at dinner. I mean, they shouldn't be in places where we're gathering with human beings. The question of substituting artificial intelligence for empathic humans, that is a question that we need to be constantly discussing because it really, once you talk about it and say, does something that has no body, that was never a child, that is that was never sick, that doesn't know pain, that was never in a family, that, that never wanted love, that was never rejected, is that going to understand me <laughs> in the ways I need to be understood? During COVID, is something that doesn't fear death something that's going to understand my problems now? And if not, well, it shouldn't be your personal mm. chat partner. <laughs> <laughs> you, you need to find yourself a, a person, person and let the internet help us find people all for that, all for that. Let the internet help us find people. I think that's a good piece of advice uh, to end on. So Sherry Turkle, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape podcast. My pleasure.